Today's powerful conversation is from last year's virtual Thermostat Cultures live event that I host, and this conversation took place in the midst of the pandemic and all the challenges we were and are facing in the world, especially issues of social justice and systemic racism. I hope you enjoyed this look back at the conversation about how to lead during these times. I was joined by my friends Kevin Clayton, VP of Diversity and Inclusion with the Cleveland Cavaliers, Ken Boyer, EY's America's Inclusiveness Recruiting Leader, and Lori Turner, VP at Leadership for Educational Equity. Enjoy this conversation that is the currency for change and learn more about this year's Thermostat Cultures live event on Friday, October 29th, 2021 at thermostatcultureslive.com, thermostatcultureslive.com. Welcome back to The Thermostat with Jason Barger. If you're currently on a commute, a walk, or just a micro break in your day, glad you're making time to step back, to think, and to reflect on the next steps on your journey. I've never been more convinced. The best leaders and team cultures in the world are the ones that make time to step back and calibrate their thermostat. I hope today's conversation leaves you feeling grounded and inspired. Now let's dive into today's topic to engage our minds and hearts in order to authentically lead and create compelling cultures wherever we are in the world. I am so excited to invite some other friends, other voices to this conversation that are voices that I'm grateful to share with you all and to learn from. Uh, I want to invite up Kevin Clayton is going to jump up and join me on stage here. Kevin uh, is somebody that uh, just in the past year, uh, a friend of a friend connected with me and said, you two just need to know each other. You just need to know each other. And so we were, we were connected and, uh, and now we've become good friends. Kevin is the Vice President of Diversity, Inclusion, and Engagement for the Cleveland Cavaliers and their operating companies. Uh, we've been aligned in messaging and, and become friends. Uh, Ken Boyer, Ken Boyer, who is uh, my guy, TCL, a thermostat culture's legend, uh, a great friend. And he is, uh, for Ernst & Young, for EY, he is the America's Inclusiveness Recruiting Leader across North and South America, all the Americas, uh, and an amazing person and a great spirit. And a longtime friend, uh, Lori Turner, is joining, uh, somebody that uh, you can see just by her smile and vibrancy. She's an amazing person, but also is, the, is a VP at an, at an organization that's called Leadership for Educational Equity, uh, doing an amazing uh, work uh, across the country and around the world. Uh, Kevin, Ken, Lori, thank you for joining me. Sure, Jason. Thank you. Thank Great you. to be here. I love it. I love it. Well, uh, we've already had some amazing, engaging conversations, and obviously I want to dive in right with you guys and pick up where we left off. I'm interested in your quick thoughts. The world that we've been living in right now, uh, many people, there's been a lot of waiting you know, this year waiting to find out uh, not just the election, but we, we started way back early this year, waiting to figure out what's happening with this virus, waiting, or what's gonna happen with our kids, waiting, wait a second, what's happening with the social justice and these decisions that are being made. And in the case of all this waiting and anxiety and division, I'm, wonder, I'm wondering from you guys, what is the leadership spirit that at least that you've, the attributes of leadership that you think about that have been needed for you personally to navigate your way through this. Who wants to take that first? That that's softball. Who who wants who wants to take that? Ken, what do you got? No, so I think for me personally, it's been, it's been hard. I think simply just acknowledging the fact that everything you mentioned, it's been really difficult. And for me, it's been a reimagining of how do I evolve as a leader to, to tackle and deal with things that I never in my life, that I've been with EY for 30 years, that I've never had to deal with. And so I, I think being very humble and continuing to learn, to trust the people that are around me. I've got a number of my teammates with me. Uh, I trust them because I think we've got to lean on each other. Um, but, but really having, uh, when people say the half glass, half full, half empty, my view now is at least the glass has some water. So I'm trying to, trying to wade through this and um, lean on others to help. 
LT, Kevin, what, yeah. what, do you, what do you think? Yeah, I'll jump in here, Jace. Um, it has been a tremendous season of learning and growth for me as a leader too, Ken. I will say um, as a woman who identifies as a white woman, leading a team, a mid-sized team of about 50 people who are more than 75% people of color in an organization dedicated to equity. Um, it has been a season, um, you know, as you can imagine, the folks that show up to do this work with me, um, fighting for more equity in public schools, they are folks who are deeply committed to this mission and personally committed. And so this season that we've been in with the pandemic, the uncertainty, the ways that COVID has cracked inequities wide open, um, you name it, the disproportionate impact on communities of color, the way the digital divide is affecting kids and communities of color, remote learning. Um, these things are affecting my people deeply and my team. Um, and I think if there's anything, any lesson that I've learned as a white leader is I've got to just be in the arena. I've got to be showing up for my people. I know I'm going to make mistakes. I'm no, I know I'm not always going to say the right thing, um, but it's so critical that I see people for who they are and what they are dealing with in this moment. And that I am also recognizing the disproportionate impact that this moment can have on folks, uh, namely staff of color and namely staff that identify as black. And so it's recognizing that, encouraging rest and recharging, recognizing our people are our number one resource. Um, so those are some of the things that I've been dealing with. Yeah, no doubt. Kev, what do you what do you think, yeah. man? Hey, hey, Jason, when I when I think about what my colleagues just talked about, I'm really thinking about courage, and from a from a courageous standpoint. And if you think about the NBA and the fact that we were the first league to kind of tilt the the, the dominoes to fall, you know, we've not had a game and been in our building since March. And what has happened on the court and off the court since then? It's taken a lot of courage, and I'm not talking about courage from a league perspective, which that absolutely was courageous, but each individual team and each leader in our, in, from our organizations, we had to step up and support what our players were doing, and I just know for what we've done here in Cleveland and myself personally, to the point that Lori just made, I have never been stretched more than I have in the past nine months, but stretched to a point where it's put up or shut up time all the values and beliefs that I have kind of had and have led by, it's now, I mean, the, the NBA has given all of us, given me an opportunity to put those on display. And it's to make decisions when our shareholders or our ticket holders don't want to hear about Black Lives Matter, when they really want to say, shut up and dribble. It's making decisions in a moment of, do we take a stand for social justice or do we just kind of sit back and let everything else happen? And I'll tell you, for, from my perspective, I work for an organization that is front and center, and we're on the battle lines of, of, of the right side of actually stepping up and showing courageous leadership. Yeah, and I, Kevin, I know from our earlier conversations, I mean, right as all of this was happening, you and I connecting a number of different times to talk about this. And I remember, especially as the NBA was being out in front of everybody, and, and in my opinion, doing such a great job of – of saying, man, just as Lori was talking about and, and Ken was talking about that these issues are so deep for so many people that rather than squelching them of, of, of empowering them and saying, no, 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 use your platforms. And in fact, we, we want you to have a voice in this. The NBA was out in front of this, but some of the language that I loved that you used in some of our earlier conversations, you said you wanted to make sure that the change that was coming, that this and the way that we are connecting people rather than dividing people, is, a, is about a movement rather than a moment. Right. To say more about how can this, the time that we're in right now, not just be a moment, but what does this look like to be a movement that we're all a part of in terms of setting a temperature? Again, diversity of thought and opinion and background, of course, but how can we all be ambassadors in that culture moving forward? Right, and, and, and Jason, thank you for bringing that up because for myself and the life that I've lived, it I've seen black men killed before. I've seen black women killed. So to the George Floyd killing at the moment that it happened, 
that was for me just it was okay here's another situation of a black person being killed by law enforcement and to think about it from the perspective of is this just another moment or is this a movement that was really the defining moment for the the league and also myself personally is how do we take this moment to make sure that we actually do eradicate systemic racism across all walks of life. So while the while, while the law enforcement focus was was front and center, quite honestly for me, I was looking at the fact of the fact that we have health disparities, the fact that we have education disparities, the fact that when you look at from a food desert standpoint, you have black and brown communities that are suffering from not having the ability to get to food. When you look at the economics and all the different systems that drive our communities, that was the opportunity for us to really make this a movement instead of a moment. Because if we focus on only on law enforcement, with all due respect, the killing of George Floyd was one of in in a in a larger picture was it was the minority of the the effects that that has on the black and brown communities. All these other systems, and you can just look at COVID that was brought up, that is killing black and brown people at a much higher rate than than law enforcement disengaging with black and brown communities. So really looking at it from a systemic standpoint is kind of what drove me and motivated me. Yeah. And, and, and just to, to, again, echo what I know you and I have talked about in the past, especially as this was happening, you were one of the first people to say, even just like, Hey, this isn't about uh, just police officers. And you were even really quick to say it, to say, this is, you know, cause there are so many wonderful police officers, so many great people, yeah. law enforcement folks that are out there in the world that are trying to do great things. But it is about stepping back and saying, what is the systematic piece of this that's leading to this? Uh, Ken, Lori, I'm interested in, in uh, you, you know, you lead diverse groups of people, diverse teams of people. And, and to enter into, especially when so many of these issues are hot button for, for, for all of us. And again, nobody wants to be labeled a racist. Nobody wants to, to, to ever be considered that. How do we enter into those conversations that are the currency for change, but do it in a way that, that, that tries to be open and listen and connect people rather than just divide and, and, and turn to anger? So, Laurie, maybe I'll start a couple of comments. Jason, we, we leaned into this conversation as a firm. I mean, we, we had what we call courageous conversations. We had groups of people on Zoom calls and literally people sharing their story for real. Like this is one of the first times in the firm, in my opinion, well, we, we got below and we got real. We got 100 on these conversations. And some of the stories that were shared, and frankly, I shared my story. So Kevin, like you, you know, when I saw the George Floyd killing, you know, I hate to admit it, but I was numb to it. But candidly, what happened is we began to have these courageous conversations with our people who I described as having their DNI aha moment at that time of seeing that video. I began to say, I can't be numb to injustice. I've got to have a voice, a larger voice in doing what I'm doing. But those real conversations, Jason, where there were tears, including some of my own shared, because I told and opened up to people about me growing up being African-American from New York City and Queens and humble beginnings. But frankly, getting real with conversations, how it allowed others to share stories and many of the allies to begin to learn and to listen. It's been an incredible journey. Um, to date. We have a lot to learn, a lot to do, but it's really, again, that DNI aha moment was critical for many people, and many people got it at that point in time. Yeah, and intentionally leaning into that and saying, uh, we're not going to pretend as if this, this isn't happening, and, and, and also realizing that, again, to, to the point that, that I made earlier, that if people are living in the world, but then we're spending 8, 10, 12 hours of our days at work think about what a tremendous opportunity it is to lean into those discussions say hold on let's help all of us navigate our way through these waters that are are are, are challenging and 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 difficult and and filled with emotion lt yeah. what from your perspective leading those diverse teams what what tips would you give for anybody yeah so i really want to build on that intentionality because not only are we talking about really difficult conversations where we want to build connection and not division, but we're talking about doing that virtually. So how are we creating that intentional, authentic space virtually? Um, I have some terrific colleagues on this call today 
who took us to a place of bringing in dialogue and circle. We're an organization that, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion is at the root of who we are. And we have, it has taken different um, tacks or different, you know, that we, we've gotten at it different ways. And this felt like we needed to move into a new space. And so we started this building an anti-racist organization dialogue series, which like I said, some of my colleagues on the, on the, on joining us today have taken the lead and putting together conversations where we're really digging into difficult conversations across the organization, across teams, across identities, and really creating a space to connect and go to a deeper level of listening and authenticity. Another thing that I'll just chime in here um, is the importance of white spaces and white people doing the work. Like we cannot rely on our, our colleagues of color to teach us. We need our own spaces, whether they're affinity spaces or resource groups, where we are holding each other accountable, where we're interrogating our bias and our practices, where we're holding up a mirror and where we can be vulnerable and say, dang, I think I have a blind spot here. Like, can you help me out? Because, you know, racism is the air that we breathe. It is, we are indoctrinated in this society. And as white folks, we have a lot of work to do to interrogate that and look at the practices that are showing up, especially, you know, I feel that responsibility greatly leading a team that I am not perpetuating the status quo um, in some of the practices that I, you know, in the ways that I lead. And so would just add, I think it's really important that we, we dig into the white spaces that are leading to meaningful action. No doubt, no doubt, and which, is, which is why we're also having this conversation right now and why, I mean, I can still picture, Ken, I, I, don't, I don't know where you were, Ken, but I still remember when all of this happened, I remember calling you up on your cell and I'm, I was pacing back and forth in my front yard and, and I was just calling to tell you, I think it was right after George Floyd and just say, hey man, I love you and uh, can I listen to you for a couple of minutes? And, 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 just, and, and, and to say, hey, I, I wanna be a part of, I don't have all the answers, I don't, I don't have many answers, but what I do want to do is be a part of a dialogue that no matter what color your skin is, that we, if, if, this tight, if, if we all play a role and are all ambassadors for the culture that we're trying to create, and we want to be about setting a temperature that connects rather than divides, then I have to. I have to be willing to have the dialogue to listen and then to say, how can we do? Kevin. Our, one of our first calls and, 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 and many conversations we had at the same time, I said, how, wh what do you need? Like, how can we help? What advice would you give to, people, to white folks or, or people that we need to begin these conversations, like Lori saying? And you said, get in the boat with right. me. Say, say more about what, yeah. for, any for any organization that might be out there, that the last thing we want is anybody, an organization or a team that might be predominantly white or may not have much diversity of uh, different uh, ethnic backgrounds, but yet they definitely are diverse in thought because every group of humans is. What would you say about how uh, advice you'd give to folks about how do you, how do you, how, tangibly, how can we get in the boat and begin to have some of these dialogues? Yeah, so, so I, I want to reference that from three perspectives. One, Ken, during his conversation, was referencing allies. And I, I have been actually asked to repeat what I've said several times on these calls around allyship, because I just look at it very differently. So, so, so Jason, don't, don't block me out on this one. Okay. My camera. No, buddy. Right. So, Go. so, so right after the George Floyd murder and then the, you know, subsequent with Richard Brooks and Jacob Blake and on and on a lot of my white friends, just like others and Ken, I'm sure were reaching out to you. What can we do? How can we help? Oh my God. I just can't believe that happened. And so first I'm like, it's been happening for, 200 years. So, okay, I'll acknowledge that. So what can you do to help? It's like, yeah, I want to be an ally. So when you think about the term allyship, typically what that means is that you have people kind of on the side. And I'd ask you to think about it from a, a river and you have a riverbank. So I'm in a boat trying to stream, trying to, trying to actually float in this, in, in this sea or river of racism. And my boat has holes in it. And my white friends 
are waving from the side saying, Kevin, what can I do to help? Hey, what can I do? I'm an advocate for you. Go keep, keep it going. And I'm looking up and I'm saying, no, damn it. Come get in the boat with me and start bailing water. You know, don't, don't, I, I appreciate the waving and Hey, I'll go make a call for you, but I want you to come in, get in the boat with me and no, you can't feel absolutely what I'm going through. But if you're standing on the sidelines, you surely aren't going to be able to feel my pain. And if you get in the boat with me, you're going to then be able to start saying, oh, wait a minute. Everything in this boat is actually wrong. So let me patch a hole here. Let me bail water here. So that's the first perspective. Allyship really means being active. When when Lori talked about from a from an anti-racism standpoint, an anti-racist perspective, I appreciate that from individuals, but I would suggest from an organizational standpoint that we look at systemic anti-racism. What does that mean? If there are systems that are broken, and I'll just say from, the, from a compensation system, and if, you, if, if someone sees that, wait a minute, women are being paid less than men to do the same job, or people of color are not being included in the same kind of learning groups as others, that is a systemic racist act within an organization. The anti-racist behavior is call it out, be courageous, and say, no, we need to do a salary equity study and fix that. But what typically happens is we just kind of say, well, it's been going on and no one has the courage to step up. So I I appreciate the anti-racist comment. I love that. I want to take it into corporations where we can actually look at systems and be anti-racist against that. And then from the perspective of getting in the boat, Come on down, jump in with me. It, it, it just can't add to that, Kevin. I love that. There's a, there's a saying I love to use, like you can't have empathy for what you don't have proximity to. So if you get in that boat, you're going to have some serious empathy because you know what's going on in this boat. Yes. Uh, yeah. The, se- the second piece, though, you know, we're a large firm, 300,000 people around the world. Kevin, we're doing exactly what you mentioned around the anti-racism. We are doing a deep dive of all of our processes from recruiting to performance management, the compensation, guess what? To identify where bias may exist, and we're going to take it out. So we are doing exactly that because that's, you got to go back to your process. If you want to get rid of the systematic challenges, you can't just talk about it. You got to be about it. No doubt. And I, I, that's why I love this language of, of getting in the boat. It's, it's active. It's saying, and again, uh, even, even when, as we just identified in the last segment, that leaders, we don't have all the answers. So none of us, none of us have all the answers, but it's that journey to go seek solutions and to say, how can we connect rather than divide? A question that's coming in, and again, uh, is saying, how do you create the atmosphere to have, uh, let's see, there you go. How do you create the atmosphere to have white colleagues engage in those discussions and explorations when so many are paralyzed by the fear of being labeled or canceled, you know, the kind of cancel culture. Um, what, what advice? Because I think this is a real thing. Of if we're inviting people into participation, if we're inviting people into conversations that are the currency for change, if we're inviting people in to say, hey, let's have a conversation that hopefully is going to connect rather than divide. What, what's, what's any tips or, or any uh, what would you say about that? How, how do we create that atmosphere where people feel comfortable or not just comfortable? Yeah, I mean, for employed. me, this might be overly simplistic, but it goes back to relationships and trust, right? Like, how do you create the container that that says, like, we are coming into this space and we're not going to be perfect and we're going to, um, you know, at times hurt each other. And so we need to have the right container the right level of trust, the same commitment, like as, as Kevin and Ken were talking, you know, I'm thinking of this thing of, of, of moving from allyship to being a co-conspirator. You know, my liberation is tied up in your liberation. So how are we creating spaces that um, are safe, brave spaces and that we know there will be, you know, some accountability, but also they are learning spaces. They are spaces where, we are coming together because we share a commitment. I will also just reinforce again that I think, you know, separate white spaces are important because harm can be done, right? By bringing everyone together and folks who maybe are in different places in their journey and it can't become 
um, a place of, um, you know, teaching or, um, you know, playing, playing too much to white fragility or what have you, but it, 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 we need to arrive at a place where we can come and have the authentic conversation that's not going to be perfect, but that we're all sort of aligned on what it is that we're working towards. And, and, and just yeah. for, for me, yeah, for, for me, what Lori said around the trust piece, because my, my response to the question would be, how do you handle difficult conversations with your white friends? I mean, so it's no yeah. different. There's this, and it's this whole thing that we talk about. It's called FCT, familiarity, comfort, and trust, that if I become more familiar with who you are, I become more comfortable. And to the extent that I'm more comfortable, it allows me to have trust. So it's developing of the relationship that allows us then to have the difficult conversations. And what I will share, and, and, and Ken is a man of color, you may have an opinion on this. Black folks are the most forgiving, warm, welcoming people that you would ever want to meet. I mean, it's like, please come on in, ask me. I'm more than willing, because I know what you're thinking, because I see when you walk past my cubicle there, that you're kind of looking a, a certain way at me. Please come on in and ask. I totally agree, Kevin. And Jason, frankly, this environment is a good one, right? Maybe we set up some post conversations because I'm happy to talk to anyone without judgment. If you don't have the answer, you don't want it, you want to know something, ask, because that's how we get through this. But the question is real. Frankly, that's why we can't make progress. To keep people scared. They don't want to say the wrong thing, do the wrong thing. And Jason, back to your if conversations are the current for currency for change, we can't have conversations, no change. Hey everyone, I'm excited to share with you that Thermostat Cultures Live, the event, is coming back Friday, October 29th, 2021. As many of you know, this event that I've hosted over the last five years has been an inspiring day of development focused on authentic leadership and creating compelling cultures. I've been joined by powerful voices like Howard Bihar, former president of Starbucks, Shane Battier, two-time NBA champion, Jenny Britton, uh, founder of Jenny's Ice Cream, Jessica Jackley, co-founder of Kiva, Cameron Mitchell from Cameron Mitchell Restaurants, Greg Oden, former NBA number one draft pick, and on and on and on. This year, Thermostat Cultures Live is going to be a hybrid event. There's going to be a powerful VIP in-person experience uh, with limited seating in Columbus, Ohio, and a virtual experience for those wanting to participate remotely. So please visit thermostatcultureslive.com, thermostatcultureslive.com, or jasonvbarger.com to learn more. And I hope you'll consider joining this as an individual or as an entire team. I hope you'll help share the word and join these conversations that are the currency for change. That's right. That's right. Uh, I'm going to invite if, if I'm going to have Law come back up here because uh, I think she she'd be great to to jump into this. And because one of the things that she said earlier that's now coming just into my mind is was talking about the idea that none of this is an overnight experience. Again, we all. To, to, to Kevin's point, I mean, this has been happening for, for years and years and years, generations. And so none of it gets changed overnight, but yet from a leaning into those conversations and engaging your people, a willingness to just say, hey, like Ken, Ken as you just said, like, hey, let's, let's create a space or a container like that, like Lori's talking about, to say, all right, we're not going to solve all this. And we don't, you don't sit down and have one conversation to solve this, but what, what, how do we feel about it? And then what are, what are going to be those intention and intentional actions that are going to come of this conversation? Mm -hmm. Re react um, to that. Well, first of all, thank you all. I was sitting there taking notes to everything y'all were saying. So thank you for participating and sharing those kind of things. Um, I, I definitely agree that the container, I love the idea of the container of, it has to be a strong container to, to be, able to pour into it and for it to be able to hold what is coming, you know, and I think about, you know, the conversations that need to happen. Like, first of all, are you coming with the mindset that you want to learn on both sides? Is this side, do you want to learn here? Do you want, I want to learn too? Great. Let's meet here knowing that we both want to learn and we're open to learning. And then we share a little bit and then you share a little bit. And so it's this give and take back and forth so that we can grow to try to understand each other and know what each other needs. I mean, it's that whole listening piece all over again and I mean I'm kind of similar to Ken and Ke and I'm sorry not Ken and Kevin I'll say Ken and Kevin 
Um, I was thinking about um, how do I open up myself and allow you to come and talk to me? Like, I don't want to shut anybody out. I want, if you have an honest, curious question, how do you come and ask me and me say, okay, let me help you with this instead of saying, well, why don't you know this already? Oh my goodness. You know, so that will turn people off. So you got to open up and let, let people come to you and say, this is what I think. And, and I want to know why, why I should be thinking different. And you give them reasons to think differently or examples of how they can think differently. I love it. Let me add one quick thing. You know, I've yeah. had, this is pre-COVID. I've had a number of what I call uncomfortable lunches with people, and we label them uncomfortable lunches. That is a safe space to sit down, break some bread, and have some real dialogue about who I am, who you are, what questions do you want to ask. So I think you've got to figure out your culture, how to make that work. But that's something I've used, and, and frankly, it's worked pretty well. I love it. We've got a question that's coming in that keeps getting upvoted. A question to Lori, uh, and then I want everybody else to chime in for this, mm -hmm. saying, Lori, as a white woman, how do you handle uh, people of color saying you shouldn't lead in the DEI conversation, that you are taking opportunity or leadership away from someone else? What's the response? Because, again, you, you know, it's, it's one of those situations where uh, we've got to be involved in the conversation, but certainly uh, – What's your response? Yeah, to that? so just leaning into the vulnerability and the the authenticity. I mean, I ask myself this question sometimes: Am I the right leader? Am I the right leader for this team at this moment? And I think that's a, an interrogation that I often ask myself. And what what it makes me think about, and the practice that it drives for me is thinking about bringing other voices and, and, and leadership into the space. So I love going back to this notion that like leadership is not this place where you arrive, right? Like, because I'm leading the team, I don't have all the answers. Um, but I think very intentionally about who am I bringing into the conversation? Leadership is everyone's business. Like, who is helping with decisions? Who, you know, I mean, of course, things like promotions and and include, you know, being being um, super thoughtful about opportunities for folks. But I think it's also just a daily practice of ensuring um, that there is a diversity of voices in the conversations that we're having and the decisions that we're making. And then, you know, frankly, I mean, I think we we. We give tremendous thought to this at Leadership for Educational Equity at every phase from hiring to promotions, to your point, Kevin, about equity and salary bans, um, and certainly on the leadership team as well, and who is stepping into the, the, the positions of power. And you know, while we have a diverse leadership team at Leadership for Educational Equity, I would be lying if I would if I said like these aren't these aren't questions that that I grapple with. Um, so you know, I think I have to have the confidence in my values as a leader and what it is I'm here to do and look for opportunities. Um, you know, they say every every leader should have a successor. I have my successor picked, and she's amazing. And and you know, I'm I'm thinking through these things of like what are the opportunities. For the person who's next in line. Yeah, hey, hey Jason, if, if I could weigh in on that, because I, I mean, I, I really got some strong feelings about the concept that black and brown people own the diversity conversation. So here, here's my point: that if you think about diversity, if we're talking about it from defining what that means, then that includes everybody. You know, as far as white males are concerned, I've never met two white males that were the same in my life. But if you're using diversity Thank as a code word for just black and brown, then let's just call it black and brown. Don't call it diversity. So to that extent where that black and brown people own the diversity conversation, quite honestly, that is what uh, one of the challenges and barriers we have, that it's us trying to, trying to, as Lori said earlier, it's us trying to fight through this by ourselves. No, everybody comes to the table owning a piece of the diversity conversation. Now, is there opportunity for certain dimensions of diversity to be uplifted because the data will show that there are discrepancies and disparities? Absolutely. But we can't walk into this saying that when we talk about diversity, that just means black folks. No, that is a limited, you will have a limited outcome if that's the way an organization is looking at it. Well, and, and, I, and I would say, uh, just again, to echo what I know, by knowing you all and knowing the heart and the spirit of everybody that's involved in this, I know there are people that are in the virtual space and are connected to organizations that right now in the world, 
especially wanting to create cultures that are open, are inclusive, are welcoming to, to people, no matter uh, diversity of all kinds, right? And, and also realizing that in the world we live in now, if culture is a competitive advantage, we also need to figure out how do we attract great people? I don't care what color you are. Mm -hmm. Like uh, great people that are talented, that have gifts to serve, and, and to make it so that we can attract and we can develop and grow and retain a culture of great humans. Mm -hmm. And I know that m many people, organizations that are on this call today, that that's the way they're thinking. A another question that came in, how do you feel included when you have the top, usually <laughs> in quotes, not look like me or fully understand the experience of being a person of color? What, ta what talk about leading how what we oh we talk about leading how is that fully possible is it, yeah, that question making sense to you well i think for for me one of the things i wanted to piggyback on something you said earlier about having a conversation i think language is, is one of the things to understand i know there's a lot of companies when they say we need more diverse candidates here they really are talking about black and brown something kevin was talking about instead of saying just we need more black people or people of color or whatever. And I think that's part of it too. But then I often find in some companies, if they say, well, we want diverse candidates, but we want them to be qualified. So that's already coming in with a bias in your head about who you're bringing into the organization. And you have to almost catch yourself and say, would I say that about any other nationality or whether it's white man or whatever? Well, we always want, we want white men, but we want them to be qualified. That never has the same you know, kind of connotation. So it's like being mindful of language and understanding how to speak about the things that you need for your organization, yep. I think is really important. But then to the to person's question is representation matters. You know, if I walk into an organization and I don't see anyone who looks like me in a leadership position, I automatically think it's not possible for me. But I also think about a place of scarcity, scarcity instead of abundance. Because if I finally see there's one, I'm like, well, there's room for one, so I got to wait till that one is done, and then I can try. Instead of thinking, can we make more room for everybody at the top? Can we add one more without feeling like number one, we're in direct competition with each other? Because that's sometimes the thought. If there's more than one black person or a person of color, they say, well, well, I got to make sure I'm better than her because I want them to look at me better or him or whatever, and that creates that. I guess, anxiety that you can't be together. We can only have one. It's not like Highlander. You can, there can be more than one, <laughs> you know? And so I think that becomes the challenge is that people feel like there's that place of scarcity instead of abundance. Yeah, so the can other I, thing I, I would, I'm sorry, Jace. The other thing I would add too, though, let, let's just be clear. No matter where you are, you got to perform. You got to perform. And it's yeah. about building relationships. The, the other thing, and this is just for me personally, when I first started with the firm, what I actually did not do, and people talk about it now, People say, oh, you got to bring your authentic self to the workplace. I always say your authentic professional self. But, but what I did, I didn't bring any of myself to the workplace when I first started with the firm. In fact, I tried to hide everything about my upbringing, the fact that I was first generation, all those things. And it wasn't until, and I got great advice by someone who basically said, Ken, we brought you here to be who you are. And, and once I opened up and was real about me and what I was bringing to the firm, like I got, I won't say accepted, but I felt comfortable and my confidence level was up. My performance was better. And then it was like, I'm going to make it here. I'm going I'm to navigate this place and I'm going to make it. But it took some adjustments on my end, frankly, to get there. So you, you got to get after it. You got to perform. You got to build relationships. You just got to be you. 100%. We're, we're, we're almost at our time. Again, I could talk about this stuff uh, all day long, but I want to keep us on schedule here. But I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to throw a little curveball. I'm going to put you on the spot here. But something you just said uh, reminded me of this law. I talk about language drives behavior. And especially with teams and organizations or many people in the virtual room, they're shaking their heads now because they know I've worked with their team to talk about, we have, if we can't describe it, we can't be surprised that it doesn't exist, right? And so we have to, language helps us drive the behavior that we want. So when we talk about the values that will help guide us, we have to be able to say, what does that value, what does that look like in action and behavior? so that we can begin to set that temperature in how we show up in the way we think, act, and interact. So if language helps drive behavior, I'm wondering if, if you had to pick one word, and I know I'm totally putting you on the spot, but I'm the guy who's allowed to ask you to do this. Uh, if you had to have one word to talk about a value that would help guide 
how you're navigating your way through the world right now in terms of this discussion we're having right now? What would be that word that would remind you that, that I want to make sure that I'm living with that value? Does that make, is that my making mm-hmm. sense in the question mm-hmm. I'm asking? What is, a, what is a word that comes to mind for each of you that if language helps drive behavior, if you want to hold it out in front of you and say, man, this is the word that I want to help guide my next step out of this event, for you, what would that word be? Empathy. Why, why empathy? Because even as a black woman, there's things that I will never experience. Maybe something with some person who might not have the ability to walk. Right. I have the ability and the use of both of my legs. So if I can understand what that person is going through, then how can I advocate more for them? How can I be an ally to them? So I think about people who are not like me and I try to be empathetic and understand what they're going through so that I can be better for them and better support them in a way that they need to be supported. My folks from CRSI and other leaders from across the state that are part of this call today, that their, their mission and their day wake up every single day to serve those with developmental disabilities right now are standing up and clapping and cheering the empathy with somebody uh, that, that you're right. I'm, I take for granted that I can use my legs every day. How, so how about, I, let me, I'll, I'll jump in. My, it would be agitator, but, but I, I'm a self-proclaimed healthy agitator in my organization because I think we're going to have to agitate if we're going to see continued change in the space. So that'd be my word. Healthy agitation. I want to, I want to, cause I know you can. Yeah. And, and, and to just be an agitator, I know is not you, yeah. but to be a healthy agitator to say, again, I'm not just throwing darts, pointing the finger, talking about who's to blame. I'm a healthy exactly. agitator. I want to be a part of solutions focused. Exactly. That's why right? I said those two words, healthy agitator, really critical because you can't be a house in a house clean up a house if you're not in it. So if you just agitate, agitate, you're gonna find yourself outside the house, i.e. your organization, and you can't do anything. Healthy agitation. I love it. I'm gonna Kevin. I'm okay. gonna jump in here with disruptive impact. So I'm sneaking into um, impact is what we all came to do at Leadership for Educational Equity. And we want to disrupt the status quo. We want to change laws and policies. And I think you know, what, whatever we are doing internally to strengthen our ability to have disruptive impact is what I want to be all about. Yeah, and Jason, for me, I'm going to end with where I started, and that is courage. And when I think about Ken, the fact that for however long that he was going on, leaving, checking himself, actually never checking himself into the door when he walked in, leaving part of himself outside. It took courage for him to finally say, yes, I'm going to bring my whole self to work. When I think about Lori, and she was, as a white female, leading this work, it takes courage. So courage is what I would leave us with, because in order to have change, we have to be willing to step out in places that we haven't stepped out before. Hmm. Great point. Hey, Jason, I'm sorry, one last thing. And this is really for the participants on this. Yeah. My, my question to the participants are what are you going to do differently going forward in this mm-hmm. space? Like, yeah. courage, Kevin, you're right. But what are you going to do differently? It can't just be the few of us on this call trying to agitate, have courage. What are you going to do? Like, this, this is the moment to lean right. in, and we need you to lean in. So let's get after it. Yeah. Absolutely. And I love Ken. Thanks for saying that. And actually you're, you're, I mean, it's as if you know my notes and you know where we're going next or something, buddy. It's like we're, we're aligned here, but the, uh, as I see people in the, in the chat box right now are writing their word, which I would encourage you. I want to, I want to, I want to challenge everybody to be thinking coming out of today. Anybody that's ever done any work with me knows the fact that I say well, that we, we got to come out of here with action. So what is it that we're going to go do differently because of our conversation that was the currency for change. We're not here just to have a nice conversation. We're connecting with each other. And we're also saying, how can we breathe oxygen into ourselves Mm -hmm. and breathe oxygen into other people? And let's be leaders that connect people. And to connect people is gonna require intentional action. Mm -hmm. So anybody who's on the call right now, I want you to put in the chat box, what's your one word? Again, you know, we're not going to carve it in stone, but you, you, can, you can do that if you want. What's the one word that's going to, you want to kind of, if language drives behavior, that's going to guide you on the way out of here. Um, 
you all are amazing humans. And again, I'm lucky to get to know you. I'm lucky that we have connected. As I've said to all of you, I wanna be a part of positive conversations that are the currency for change. I wanna be a part of solutions, not blame. I wanna be a part of action, not inaction. Um, and so I appreciate you lending your mind, your hearts, and uh, the work that you do. And I hope, and I know, I don't even just hope, I know that there are people on this call that's gonna ripple outward and make an impact on other teams and organizations immediately. So thank you for sharing your time and your wisdom with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I'm going to transition. Thank you for listening to today's podcast. And I hope the messages and questions stimulate positive change along your path. As always, if these messages resonate with you and add value to your life, I hope you'll help amplify them throughout the world. Please rate, comment, and share on whatever podcast or social media platform you're using. And share this podcast with the people in your life or work who should be part of these conversations. That way, this spirit does, in fact, spread. If these messages or developing leaders and culture would be helpful to your organization, or you have a question or comment about this podcast, please contact us at jasonvbarger.com. And remember, we all are ambassadors for the culture we want to create in our life and work. We have to own the vision we want to be a part of. The future of leadership is you, is me, is us. Be a thermostat.